Good afternoon to you all. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. A very warm welcome to our webinar on regulatory artificial intelligence, the strategic implications of AI and new technologies. A special welcome to our speaker, Dragos Tudoraki, Chair of the European Parliament Committee on Artificial Intelligence. You're very welcome, Dragos, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Dragos will speak to us for about 20, 25 minutes, and I'll go to the questions and answers uh, to your audience for any comments or questions that you may have. You can join our discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And please send in your questions during the presentation if they occur to you at that time. I'll come to you once Dragos has finished his presentation. It would be very helpful if you gave your name and affiliation when you ask a question. Thank you very much for that. Our Twitter handle is at IIEA, so join us there. And as usual, the presentation and questions and answer are on the record. Dragos, your presentation today is very timely. It's just three weeks ago that the EU published the AI regulations, 110 pages, a lot of de detailed work there on how to govern the use of artificial intelligence. A first of its kind policy, it outlines how companies and governments can use a technology seen as the one of the most significant but ethically fraught scientific developments in recent memory. Artificial intelligence in which machines are trained to perform jobs and make decisions on their own by studying high volumes of data seen by technologists, business leaders and government officials as one of the world's most transformative technology, promising major digital transformation and productivity gains. Of course, the systems become more sophisticated. It will become harder to understand why the software is making a decision, a problem that could become more problematic as computers become more powerful. Researchers have raised ethical questions about its use, suggesting that it could perpetuate existing biases in society, invade privacy or result in more uh, jobs being automated. As Margarita Vestager, the vice president of the commission has said, trust is a must, not a nice to have. But these landmark rules and regulations, the US, UE is spearheading the development of new globe global norms to make sure AI can be trusted. So the Commission's proposal is structured around developing trust in the technology by proposing the first EU legal framework intended to regulate AI applications at European level. It also plans to launch a coordinated plan with national governments to boost investment in skills and in, in infrastructure. In his address, Dragos will outline how AI and frontiers technologies are transforming the geopolitical trans landscape. Dragos will address how AI can benefit the economy and society, but also poses risks for us and be misused by authoritarian regimes. He will assess these regulations and discuss the importance of shaping the rules of the digital future so that AI can be a force for good worldwide and not just in Europe. So Dragos Tukaraki is chair of ADA, the, the European Parliament's special committee on, that, on artificial intelligence in the digital age, set up in June just a year ago. He has a very distinguished career to date, and I just go over some of his, of his accomplishments to date. He began his career as a judge and led the legal departments of OCSE and the UN mission in Kosovo. Working on justice and anti-corruption um, as the commissioner represented in Romania, he supported the Romanian EU accession. He joined the commission managing a number of key strategic unions and projects, such as the Schengen Information System, the visa information and the establishment of the EU LISA. During the migration crisis, he led the coordination and strategy in, in the unit in DG Home. 
Between 2015 and 17, he served in the Romanian government as Minister of Communications and the Digital Society and the Minister for the Interior. As chair of ADA, he sits on a range of committees and delegations, including the European Parliament's delegation with the United States. Dragos, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, it's true that it is timely uh, and <laughs> I'll be very direct. I'm happy that finally we are out of the realm of speculation because for the last year, uh, since AI has come very much on the top of the agenda in all sorts of conversations uh, here in Brussels, uh, we were all speculating as to what ultimately the commission will do <clears throat> with its proposal. Uh, we had the white paper, we had the very broad consultation that was prompted by the, by the white paper and the different stakeholders around the AI were of course trying to push what they thought was important, relevant and how the commission should frame it. So uh, again, I'm happy that finally now uh, we are out of second guessing uh, and we actually have the proposal on the table so we can actually concretely address uh, preparing for the very complex negotiations that we will have in Parliament and with the Council around this proposal, but again, now we have something concrete to chew on. And with your permission, I will leave that for the second part of my, uh, of my address, uh, going a bit through what I believe are the major highlights in this, in this text. Um, I'll start maybe with this element of, of uh, the strategic uh, or even geostrategic implication of AI. And I'll start in fact from my personal motivation to, to work on AI. Um, we have very kindly listed some of the areas of interest in my past. Uh, and you would have seen that digital was not part of what I used to do. Um, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I've dealt with, with justice, home affairs, um, migration, borders, very much in, in that area for the biggest part of my career. Uh, and somewhat digital, I'm actually, personally, I'm a digital idiot. Uh, I, I can barely use my phone and certainly my kids are much smarter than I am when it comes to, to, to latest technologies. But somehow what prompted me to, to grow an interest in this and particularly in AI was precisely the very profound transformative effect that I considered the digital revolution will have on our societies. Um, and in a way, if we take every industrial revolution in human history, they all transformed our economies, they all transformed our way of life. So one could say, well, there's nothing new. Uh, yet again, uh, another industrial revolution, a new set of technologies, uh, which yeah, certainly will change, uh, will change the way we do business, uh, maybe the way we conduct our personal lives, the way we conduct our professional lives, but ultimately it is just another piece of technology, uh, another tool, uh, which we will then need to learn how to use, adapt. Of course, it will create some uh, ripple effects, but again, it is nothing new. Well, this is where I beg to differ uh, in the sense that I did see this coming. And in a way, again, that is what prompted my interest and, and why I decided in this mandate in the European Parliament to make AI a centerpiece of my of my focus, uh, that is why I have actually fought a lot for the creation of this uh, special committee on artificial intelligence. That is why I'm also uh, chairing it. Um, and if you look also, um, Joyce, you've, you've again, very kindly listed some of the things that I also do in parliament. Uh, none of them are um, a coincidence. I sit in the EU-US delegation for a reason. I also sit in the EU-China delegation for a reason. I also sit in the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Security Defense Committee for a reason. All of these things do align and also in the Civil Liberties Committee, uh, committee for a reason. Uh, again, all of these align precisely on this point of the profound geopolitical and strategic uh, implication that 
frontier technologies, the digital transformation in general, and artificial intelligence as the spearhead of this digital transformation uh, will have, are having already, but will have in the future for how we will conduct business in the world and for the world view and the world vision of tomorrow. Um, why is that? So why is, in my humble opinion, AI somewhat different than the previous uh, industrial revolutions and transformations of the past? Because somehow it comes with, with implications that challenge the status quo more profoundly than before. Uh, at the surface or the things that everyone talks about, uh, you would say, well, of course, um, we are interacting as human beings differently because of the digital, the digitalization of our lives. Uh, COVID has just prompted uh, an acceleration of the change also in our professional environments. We're no longer working uh, in offices, we are working online. And that is something that certainly is going to stay with us uh, even after COVID for a great number of us, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, and of course, it's going to change some of the work processes for many of us and is going to have an impact on the labor market and so on and so forth. But these are again, some of the things that other technologies that were introduced in the past prompted as changes. For me, the digital transformation and AI is changing also or risks changing or maybe the risk is not the right word or will somewhat impact things that are a bit more profound and from my point of view um, and I don't want to be philosophical but but will strategically uh, change uh, the status quo and I will start with democracy and in fact that is my, that was my, my top concern when I, again, picked up AI. I think that the way and the rhythm uh, and the outcome of us going virtual is posing a fundamental challenge to how our democracies look like. Why is that? First, because I think it brings a challenge like never before to the state itself. The organization of the state, as we've known him since Westphalia, um, meant that you had the state authority with a monopoly on certain services that it was providing to its citizens, um, and with a monopoly on power, with a monopoly on legislation, and so on and so forth. And the digitalization of our world, the transformation that AI and, and the digital realm bring um, is changing that. A lot of the services that are uh, relevant for us as citizens are not only going more and more into the private sector, because it's, that's not the point. It's something that has been happening for, for a, a good number of years. But the way platforms, uh, digital platforms, are starting to, to have a profound impact on many of the things that and many of the key services that were provided by the state from medical services to education to even to security, um, there comes a point in time where the state itself needs to put itself a question. If I am to stay relevant, and if people are still to believe that it's worthwhile to come up and elect some officials uh, every four years or every five years or whatever the democratic cycle in any democratic country may be, then I have to justify my existence. I have to justify, other than the monopoly on, on legislating and on norms, which one could say is very hard to challenge from uh, either from a, an emergence of a new technology or from, from the role of the private sector. But still, again, if we put that aside, the state needs to still be able to say, I am relevant and I am actually part of the way the new world looks like. I'm part of the, new, uh, of, of the new way in which services, in which professional, societal, personal issues are being addressed in my, in my constituency. And for that, um, I'll simplify, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a much broader discussion on this one, but I'll simplify to say that I think that the states themselves need to start thinking on how they can become themselves platform 
governments in a way. So they have to understand themselves what this digital revolution means, uh, how they need to adapt themselves as states to this digital revolution and see how they can maintain their relevance in the way they exercise authority by transforming themselves the way they actually exercise that authority by moving themselves online. Um, on the surface of it, it's, it's the e-government issue and of course, moving a lot of the public services online and rendering them accessible online to citizens. But again, it's also a bit more uh, philosophical, more strategic than, than that, than the just physical availability of certain services online. It comes also certainly with a reorientation of strategic investments at the level of governments in terms of digital infrastructure, in terms of making available to every citizen uh, the access that they need to perform such digital lives, uh, either for their personal uh, benefit or for their professional and for uh, making sure that no one is left behind in, in, in having access to this new digital world. But all of this um, becomes a bit more of a, of a responsibility of the state maybe than we were used to uh, in the capital economies of the last couple of, of decades. The second reason why I believe that AI is having a profound impact on democracy is that it accelerates AI and generally the digital uh, realm is accelerating at a, at a pace that we've never seen before, tools that are undermining democracy. Uh, fake news, disinformation at a pace that we've never seen before. Uh, the possibility to go and mingle into the electoral processes of anybody that you want to basically, uh, either by state or non-state actors in a way that makes it also much easier to claim deniability than it was in the physical world. In the physical world, it's much harder to, to, to claim deniability, particularly if you're a state actor. Uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted to come and mess up with elections in I don't know where, or with a referendum on Brexit, for example, well, you had to do it physically somewhat. You had to go and I don't know, uh, put your money physically somewhere, uh, get involved in a campaign somehow, uh, support someone in a more visible and again, accountable fashion than the digital uh, realities of today uh, require. Today, and particularly with AI accelerating again the impact of these tools and how a single piece of information or disinformation or fake news can be accelerated in a matter of hours uh, to reach audiences that were absolutely impossible to reach in a physical uh, context in the physical reality before. So all of that makes frontier technologies of today, um, a major challenge, again, to how we can still uh, maintain our model of democracy untainted by uh, interference that again is, is rendered now much more possible uh, by, by, these, uh, by AI and by these technologies. Ethical issues. Another very important point, you've made it Joyce yourself in the introduction, uh, AI is raising ethical questions uh, that no other technology raised before. Uh, we can take examples left and right in almost every walk of life. The commission, if I am to now open a very small bracket for my second part on the, on the, on the text itself, on the regulation, the commission has already identified, uh, tried to identify four specific areas where AI will be prohibited, particularly precisely because it raises such profound ethical questions uh, that they should be simply banned, prohibited from actually uh, being developed and rolled out. But certainly, again, AI is raising some, is raising some ethical uh, questions that, that uh, we've never had before. Um, and now another reason why I consider AI uh, of strategic or geostrategic importance is um, our position in the world and how AI is becoming a centerpiece in foreign relations and in the way the, uh, 
the geopolitics of the years to come are going to play out. I'll start with the transatlantic relationship because I believe that is absolutely fundamental for how we as Europeans, uh, including in how we are embarking in this AI journey or in this digital transformation journey, how we need uh, to stay, that is my personal deep conviction, how we need to stay in tune with our transatlantic partner, uh, the US, if we want to really make sure that our model of uh, a democratic digital transformation is the model that remains sustainable and that will be followed by other like-minded partners around the world, in contrast with other models that are being very aggressively promoted by, and I'll be very direct and abrupt, uh, by the likes of China, Russia, or others. So uh, whether maybe one or two or three years ago, um, the digital file in the relation between the EU and the US meant taxing GAFA or things that were somewhat seen in that context of, okay, how, deal with, how do we do with, and how do we deal with antitrust or how do we deal with the, uh, with the impact of, of the big uh, tech giants on our, uh, on our markets and, and in relation to our own uh, uh, companies so on and so forth. Now, again, it has raised to a level of strategic importance. And I think that is how we have to decode the announcements made both by the EU side as well as by the, by the US side uh, since the election of Biden and since the, let's say, the reopening, uh, re-engagement, the reinvigoration of the, of the transatlantic route. Uh, we have called, as Europeans, we have called, as you know, for a TTC, for a trade and technological um, council precisely for that reason, because we also understood and with a, an AI instrument at the heart of it, because we understood that this is a fundamental strategic piece of conversation that we need to have as part of our EU-US new agenda. And the Americans themselves have called for an alliance of tech democracies. And when you speak of an alliance of tech democracies, again, these are not words that are just coming out of, I don't know, someone thinking uh, late at night that it is uh, nice and sexy to talk about uh, a tech alliance. No, because also the US side considers that it is now fundamentally important that like-minded partners around the world, clearly with the EU US being a fundamental alignment, but there you have also Canada, you have Japan, you have South Korea, you have Australia. So all of these, well, you can say UK now because uh, when we speak of EU, we can't, we can't uh, unfortunately consider UK as part of it. Uh, so that all of these, uh, again, uh, partners that still understand values in the same way, that still understand democracy in the same way, whatever differences they may have in terms of how they might calculate the economical implications of frontier technologies and who needs to be competitive with whom, putting that aside or going past that for the first time, going past that, the issue of alignment in terms of how we set the rules of the digital world of tomorrow and the rules of the AI development of tomorrow becomes a strategic uh, priority. And one which we need to address together, even with the difficulties of maybe different cultures in terms of how we regulate and different traditions and all that, but it has to be part of the, part of the effort that we make now jointly. And again, not a coincidence, there is great opening now on both sides to have a very quickly and a very solid, very applied, very pragmatic dialogue on artificial intelligence, on how we regulate artificial intelligence. I'm hearing for the first time, congressmen and women speaking of their readiness to regulate. Um, and the fact that we regulated first, just like we did with GDPR is no longer perceived as an arrogance of the Europeans who are quick in regulating or trying to impose a standard on the world. Okay, it doesn't mean that they will agree with how we did it and, and, and with everything that is in it, but they recognize that it is time that we speak of, of some sort of a regulatory alignment here. And as Aida Chair, I can tell you that I've been, I've been for the last six months in very intense contact with the AI caucus in the Congress 
Um, and very soon, uh, probably by the end of, of this month or in June at the latest, we'll have a first kickoff a meeting of a structured dialogue between AIDA and, and the AI caucus uh, that hopefully will be, will be allowing us to, to, to have a, a, <clears throat> a very solid conversation and exchange on how we, we make this alignment. And now I'll, I'll close with a with few considerations on the regulation itself. And then of course, uh, I'll let you guide me with your questions through the, the points of interest for you. Um, I think the first thing that needs to be said is that it's, 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 it's great that it's there. Um, the fact that we managed to, 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 to fill this, this, this space and be the first ones to come forward with, with legislation on artificial intelligence, <clears throat> past the uh, principles and the guidelines and other form of loose instruments that had already been agreed in multilateral fora, OECD, and other uh, context, which was, was was a very good start in itself. But now, again, the fact that we are the first ones to put uh, on the table a piece of legislation is important. We have marked, again, the territory as EU, and I think it's, it's, it's essential that we did. It's important that we did. I think there are some, some very good points in, in this text, uh, and they are there because of the fact that the Commission got smart uh, last year and did not rush as they had initially said that they would legislate in the first 100 days. They, let, they listened to reason, they listened a lot to also us. We have made a great push in parliament to convince and give them the political alibi uh, not to fulfill their promise of legislating in the first 100 days. We told them it's fine, we'll forgive you for not sticking to that objective, but don't rush before you understand exactly what you need to legislate. So the fact that the commission has, has started first with a white paper, that it has embarked in, in this very broad consultation of last year, listening to all stakeholders possible, to then come arrive to a point where they were relatively certain as to what are exactly the points and how to make them in the legislation is a good process. And uh, again, it is reflected in the way the text is built. The key uh, requirement, which, which we have pushed for a lot, at least my, my political group uh, renew, uh, which was to allow for differentiation, uh, which the commission is, call, is, is calling a risk-based approach, to move away from, from, from blanket regulation, from trying to, to come with one size fits all type of, type of solutions, but to actually take applications for what they mean and for the kind of results and, and outcomes that they produce to take also sectors, not as a monolithical uh, sector, uh, in other words, meaning that, oh, if it's defense, it means it's banned, or if it's, I don't know, uh, um, something else, it means it's allowed. No. In every sector, in every walk of life or, or, or economical domain, there can be applications uh, applications that are prohibited just as well as there can be applications that, that need, need no regulation at all. And the fact that the Commission has, has, has embraced this approach of differentiation and risk-based with, with several layers of risk, several gradients from the bans all the way to, no, to, to deregulation, I think that's, that's a very good thing. Another positive thing is the fact that it has allowed for uh, adaptability in rules, which was a great challenge, which many raised. How can you regulate something that will evolve so quickly in time? By, by the time we'll be finished with the negotiations, already AI would have looked completely different. So uh, although it's not easy with the current rules in place under the treaties, but the commission has found a way to allow for adaptation of the various conditions in the legislation by means of implementing acts and the annexes. It has moved a lot to the annexes and it has done that deliberately so that it can adapt, it can grow, uh, and, and, and tweak uh, the norm as, as, it, uh, as, as it evolves and as the technology evolves. Sorry, my lights went off. Um, and, and also it has a specific chapter on sandboxing, uh, which also I think is very important because again, it allows for companies to, to go into a safe environment where it can interact with regulators and make sure that what they, what they develop is something that, that, that fits with the rules. Now, some of the negative, and I'll stop, I've already taken a lot of time. Um, some of the negatives, um, I fear 
fragmentation. Um, what everyone has been calling for, uh, and not since now, since basically the start of the first instruments on, on regulating the digital market was to make sure that we actually make good use of the scale of the EU uh, market in its entirety. And that we arrive at that single digital market that we all claim we wish to have. Unfortunately, what I don't see in here, and in fact, the, it's, a, it's a very worrisome pattern that I observe. Because if I, if I start with the instrument of November last year with the Digital Governance Act, and then the DSA, and then the DMA, and now the AI, and then there are a few more that are coming, they all seem to repeat the same model, where you have a set of European rules set out in these texts, in these proposals, in these regulations that will be norm, uh, equally applicable across the land, but there's a lot left to national competence, to national authority, to regulate in terms of how it will actually be implemented in practice, how it will be verified, uh, how the certification will be done, how the sanctions will be applied. And that, from my point of view, brings a, a substantial risk of fragmentation. We all know that the 27 of us have different cultures, different administrative histories, different ways of transposing these EU norms. And if I'm a small startup, I don't know, in the middle of the EU, and I actually wish with my application to reach the potential of the entire EU market, I'm going to have a hard time if I have 27 different ways in which uh, the AI regulation was, was implemented, if I have 27 different national authorities that are telling me uh, whether my application is, is uh, in a way or another way, and if I have 27 different sanction, uh, sanction regimes. So I wished, uh, and I still wish because I'm, the process of negotiation has just started. And again, multiply that with, with five or six, because again, in the, in the Governance Act, there is a set of national authorities. In the DSA, there is a set of national authorities. In the DMA, there is a set, and, and each of them are supposed to gather up in some sort of an EU governance body. Uh, so we'll have four or five or six different governance bodies de dealing with different pieces of what is supposed to be a single digital market. It's not, I think, very savvy. And that's something that we will need to, to try and see if we can correct it uh, during the negotiations. There are many more things to say about the text itself. I'll stop here. I've already taken more than half an hour. Uh, sorry for that. Never tell a politician no. that, that, that I can have 25 minutes because I'll take 40. So uh, I'm, I'm in your hands for questions. Yes. Thank you very much, Dragos. Not at all. I think, uh, thank you for a, a, an excellent presentation. And I think um, putting it in that strategic context, there's lots of questions, but I'd just like to ask you one, one question. It's a very general one. Um, in that kind of strategic context and the kind of human-centric, values-based approach, are we, you know, in Europe, as you say, the 27 member states, are we having that discussion or have we just suddenly jumped to the regulations and looked, you know, the high risk, low risk or that differentiation? So are we having that discussion? Do you, do you, you know, I'd have to say it's the first time that I've heard that so well argued and presented as really not just something factual, but a concern that, be, that we'd have to work through. Well, I'll be brutally honest, uh, not enough. Um, and in fact, again, one of the reasons why I decided to, to embrace this particular topic was exactly out of my almost fear that no one seemed to be talking about this. Mm. That we were somehow all sleepwalking into, into just the economical aspects uh, and the industrial policy aspects or the consumer protection and privacy considerations of what the digital transformation means, but no one was actually uh, speaking in a joint up, somewhat of a coherent coordinated fashion of the implications again for, for democracy, of the implications for, for the organization of the states themselves, for the strategic relations at the global level, so on and so forth. Or at least I wasn't <laughs> connected to, to where those conversations were, were taking place. And when I arrived in, in, in Parliament, because it's my first mandate uh, in the European Parliament, when I arrived here and I started to ask colleagues, listen, uh, 
where do you discuss these things? They were all looking at me and saying, are you kidding? There's no place. Mm. Uh, and in fact, at the very start of the first week of, of the mandate, um, I took advantage of, of uh, we were discussing, we were meeting in different configurations with, with leaders because we were preparing for the, for the discussion of the top jobs. Um, and in fact, I, I spoke to, to, some of the, to some of the top political leaders at the EU and also at national level, asking them, listen, don't you think it's, it's time that at least in European Parliament, we create a, a standing committee that actually discusses these sort of digital issues uh, together. Uh, there was, uh, I, I found that there was suddenly an audience for it, but we didn't have the time to actually uh, go through the motion of creating a standing committee, which is quite a complicated bureaucratic affair in Parliament in time. And that is why afterwards, uh, I did not abandon the idea. And then I pushed for the special committee on AI in the same package with a special committee on disinformation, fake news. Um, and I was happy that at least we managed that because again, now we have a place where apart from the standing committee that will look at the ethical issues, the privacy issues, the consumer protection issues, the industrial issues, whatever, in the legislative committees, we now have a place uh, where we can actually bring all of these threads together. And this is what we've been doing with AIDA for the last seven months. Uh, since we started, we had our first hearing in, in October last year. We are putting these topics, these topics that are forcing, in a way, uh, um, uh, a merger of all of these implications into discussions and considerations that are looking a bit from further above um, at, the, at the implications of AI uh, and that are connecting the dots. Uh, we're, still, we're still doing it. It's, 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 it's a learning process. Yeah. We are educating our members a lot as well on, yeah. in this exercise. But again, I feel that now the momentum is there. And if I also look at some of the strategies that the member states have, have produced on AI and at the processes that, that they had behind the production of those strategies, there are also quite a number of national parliaments that have created uh, also themselves some special committees on AI and also uh, had this sort of political deliberations as to, as to what it means uh, for societies, economies, and, and, and democracies. Again, I think that now the critical mass is building up to start uh, having these conversations. Great, Dragos, and thanks for your persistence and that in, 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 in ensuring that that would happen. I, there's lots of questions coming in, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back, I'll go to the audience. Um, the first one is uh, goes to the EU-US uh, relations. What are the commonalities and differences between the EU and the US on the subject of regulating artificial intelligence? Will finding a common position on regulation be a major challenge? And just finally, do you have any sense of what the initial thoughts currently are in the US as regarding the US AI proposal so far? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that I started off in my uh, interaction with, let's say, my American counterparts, with, with the regulators on the other side of the Atlantic, um, thinking that they'll probably consider us to be completely off mark, uh, or as I said earlier, arrogant, or, or in a way not understanding how uh, the digital industry works. Uh, and to my surprise, it wasn't the case at all. Um, in fact, there are two things that are interesting that are happening. Uh, I was also surprised that the big tech companies themselves uh, have started to talk about the need for regulation, which for me was a big surprise. Um, to hear Google, Apple, Amazon, even fa Facebook to a lesser extent, I think Zuckerberg is still in, in, in La La Land, uh, but, um, but all the other ones, Microsoft, uh, very much understanding that there is uh, an ethical, uh, a set of ethical issues that are being raised by the way these platforms develop and how they mean and what they mean now for our daily lives. 
that they cannot simply handle themselves uh, through self-regulation or through some sort of an internal mechanism for compliance or for ethical, I don't know. Uh, and they themselves, I can tell you, I've, I've been talking uh, with pretty much every uh, major big tech company out there at the level of uh, CEOs or presidents of boards or whatever. And they all say, listen, regulate us. Which mm. I think that two, three, four years ago, would have been a complete, uh, a, a complete uh, impossibility. And I think that also, why am I saying it? Because I think that also explains why also at the level of the policymakers in the US, there is now a different stand. It's a different attitude. They themselves are looking again at regulation. They had a special commission themselves on AI, which started from uh, a focus on defense and security but very much broadened its perspective to pretty much every walk of life and economy. And they've produced a report, which I invite you to, to, to go through, um, which is a very interesting piece of reading, which again shows how concerned also the US Congress is as to the implications of AI. And you'll be surprised to see how many commonalities, you're asking of commonalities, how many commonalities you'll find with what we say here in Europe. Mm -hmm. The concerns we have on ethics, on biases, on, on uh, implications for, uh, on the whole explainability of, of technology, all those things, uh, including implications on education and, and, and uh, the, the labor markets of tomorrow and the adaptability of, of uh, all of those are things that they are concerned with themselves. Uh, and therefore, again, mm, maybe they will take a different legislative route or normative route simply because they have a different culture when okay. it comes to that, but they will be trying to regulate the same, the, the, the same things or approximately the same things. That's, that's very interesting. Um, we've uh, another question related to the US from Michael Benhamo, and he's asking the question, the US intends to spend 8 billion on AI. The EU plans 1 billion, according to the European Commission Action Plan. How can Europe fill the gap? Will we use the recovery plan for AI? Yes, that's a big, uh, it's a very good question. It's a very big uh, concern I have as well. Uh, you, know the, you know the saying, uh, you, you have to put your money where your mouth is. Yes. And unfortunately, we're not doing that. Mm. We're not matching the political rhetoric with the right level of ambition when it comes to, to spending. Uh, there was a big discussion uh, for the MFF. Luckily, uh, for the recovery uh, plan, we have this, this threshold of 20%, which needs to be filled uh, with digital investments. Now, we will see how governments understand <laughs> uh, what a digital investment is and how much it will go into infrastructure. Not that that is not necessary. That is important as well. It's a precursor. You can't... Uh, you can't develop AI, you can't expect uptake of AI if, if uh, infrastructure is not there. So if it's infrastructure, so be it. But uh, again, it's important for governments to at least uh, try to fit the 20% of, of the recovery fund for digital and as much as possible for innovation, for research, for rolling out frontier technology as much as possible. Um, it's also, I think uh, it will be a challenge for the commission to try to bridge what the different member states will be doing in terms of investments so that there is uh, some sort of a coherent evolution and, and networking, particularly for the research and innovation uh, projects. Uh, because again, if we don't manage to, to rip the benefits of the 27 member state market, yeah. if we will be all be playing with our little toys inside our little yeah. countries, yeah. Uh, because we are all small, even if we're Germany, we're still small in, in this global competition, mm -hmm. then we will be missing, missing the point. So yes, I, I don't think that we're investing enough uh, with RRF and doubled also with some uh, domestic uh, government allocations uh, apart from RRF and there are governments which are actually spending quite, quite a lot of money on, on AI. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's better than it used to be, but not, not good enough. Not enough. But is it your point again, though, there needs to be 
more kind of integration and, uh, and some kind of linkage between national strategies Absolutely. and the European Absolutely. strategy. As yeah. many cross-border projects as possible. Yeah, as exactly, much, yeah. Particularly, for, again, for the research and innovation yeah. uh, for universities, for all those that are doing, uh, that are embarked in, in, in hmm. this creative part of digitalization and AI. Uh, and this is where commission has to help in, in, in forcing a link up. Yeah. Well, I suppose that point you're making, AI is a global technology. It's not a, you know, a European technology, an American technology. So you need that collaboration. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd hope the universities will, they will respond if they're given the funding and the structure because they, they are used to working together. Um, I have a question from Frédéric Moreau from France. Um, he's asking, another area about defense. What is your opinion about be, the link between AI and defense? Should the union have a very strict legislation with the risk of letting other powers like China, Russia and the US developing weapons that would overwhelm our own defenses? Uh, a very, very topical uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm smiling because just this morning uh, we had a shadows meeting. A shadows meeting, for those that are less familiar with how the public works, is where the rapporteurs uh, assigned by each political group for a particular file, it's where they meet and they negotiate the, the final product, the report behind a piece of legislation or a report for a debate and so on and so forth. And there is this EU NATO. Uh, report coming up in the European Parliament, and I am the, the shadow rapporteur for, for Renew on this, on this file. And in fact, just this morning, uh, we are now approaching the, the final stage of the negotiations, and we had quite a long discussion about whether we should have wording calling for a ban uh, on uh, basically autonomous weapons, basically weapon systems okay. driven by, by artificial intelligence and without any form of, of uh, human oversight, or not any form, but basically that can uh, decide by themselves when to, to, to push the button, let's put it this way. Um, and well, I, was, I, I can't, not, not, not that I'll spare you the details, I can't tell you the details of the negotiation itself. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. You you have to see that in the final version of the of the report. I, I think it will come up in uh, by by mid June for the plenary in June, and I think it's going to be a very interesting read. But uh, all this to say that um, there is, uh, I think, a, a very solid majority here in the EU uh, that believes that uh, artificial intelligence deployed in the area of autonomous weapons is something that brings to higher risk. Yeah. Uh, to to let it pass. Uh, of course, there is the question which which uh, you have asked yourself: uh, Is that not giving a competitive advantage to those that would not have the same ethical dilemmas that we have, uh, China, Russia, uh, or others, and that may might as well go ahead and develop those, and then leave us uh, with a disadvantage tactically. Um, and while it is a very point to make, I also think that for, again, for the way we understand values and for the way we understand the principle of putting humans at the center of technological advancement and not letting fundamental decisions that are linked to human lives uh, be taken without any form of human control, I mm. think we need to uphold this value. Uh, yeah. I think it is, uh, it is for us, again, uh, liberal democracies around the world, hence the need for a strategic uh, alliance. tech alliance of democracies, the one that the uh, US is calling for. Uh, and if, let's say, our part of the world makes very clear uh, how, in which conditions, and what are the ethical limits for developing these sort of weapon systems, what those standards are, uh, I think that will be quite an important political and geopolitical statement, which I still believe that we need to make with the risk that maybe China or Russia or others may be deciding to, to go and do something else. Yes. Um, thanks, Dragos. We've a question here from uh, Mark Dempsey, and he asks why the EU didn't anticipate the immense power of private platforms 
that they've gained over the discourse, discourse beyond borders, including through hundreds of takeovers of platforms such as Google, Facebook, and other dominant players? Well, because there wasn't, uh, we're still liberal democracies, as I was saying, and we're still liberal economies <laughs> uh, based on market rules. And based on market rules, um, and, and based on, on, again, what we believe economies should look like, uh, there, was a, there was a limit as to what states uh, could intervene and do uh, in, in a free market uh, okay. economy. But um, by the time, and it's true that, that uh, we nevertheless allowed platforms to grow too big. And by now, everyone recognizes that. Uh, yes, you could say a bit too late, uh, and it is true, uh, but I would say better late than never. Uh, mm. So at least now we have the DSA, mm. at least now we have the DMA, which is meant to do precisely that, to roll back some of the consolidation that these platforms have, have achieved okay. over time, a bit unchecked. Yes, it's true, a bit unchecked. And we tried to check it with, with insufficient tools. We, we thought that we thought that antitrust tools would be sufficient. Mm. Uh, the Americans thought the same. They thought that the way they dealt with Microsoft 20 years ago was sufficient to also deal with Google, Amazon, or, or Apple, or Facebook. Well, the reality of today shows that it's not enough. Simply opening an antitrust investigation is not enough. Uh, mm. You need rules. Um, and this is what now we do as Europeans with the DSA and DMA. We are rolling back. We are trying to unstructure, to unbundle uh, some, of the, some of the bundling that these companies have done to, to achieve this massive uh, footprint in our economies. And uh, again, while it, it may be a bit too little too late, but it's, it's important that it's now, it's now on the table. Thank you for that. There's another question really about IT as a profession. It's from Mary Cleary. She's the Secretary General of the Irish Computer Society. She says, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And she asked the question, as IT in general is an unregulated profession, what is your view on standards registration for IT professionals who design and implement these applications? Well, I think the time for that will come as well, inevitably. It's mm. true that IT in general and those embracing IT as a profession, as a career, or developing things as a hobby, they were the pioneers. Um, they were the pioneers uh, playing in a, in, in a field that was deregulated, uh, but it was new, creativity and, and initiative was free to roam the roam the uh, the land and and grow in whatever direction it wanted to this is what the reality of the last two decades in terms of digital uh, has been well now as i was saying earlier i want to repeat myself now that reality has reached the stage uh, and we as policymakers have reached the stage where we are looking at this reality and saying hmm uh, wait a minute uh, now it's time for some rules and those rules will also have to apply to the IT profession. Uh, that will need to be structured somewhat. I don't have a, so don't take my words now as meaning anything because uh, um, again, it's, it's, uh, I, I just think that, that we need to start thinking about that as well. Uh, because each of the different types of roles that an IT guy or gal uh, might, might have, uh, has different implications. It's one thing to be a, a developer of a certain type of application. It's another thing to, to, to play with, with other aspects of, of IT uh, and or to play with hardware or so God knows what. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an IT specialist at all. I don't even know all of the things that, that, that you guys do. Uh, but again, I think it's time to put some structure into that. And I think that sort of predictability and, and a better frame will also help the profession uh, also in terms of, of how how it, it, it is in, it's taken on by those interested in this profession and also how it is being, uh, uh, is being rolled out. 
Thank you very much for that. Um, two last questions, lots of questions. I, I hope we could get these in now. Um, this is from Sophie Petitjean. She's from, a journalist from Context. I have a question regarding the work of the European Parliament in terms of AI. It seems again that there'll be a conflict of competencies between the involved committee. To which committee should get the lead? Isn't it a bit frustrating to have such a conflict between a formal committee where, when there's a special committee? Parlous, she says, I see you smiling, uh, though existing. Yes, I think one of the, again, I'm, I'm new to this parliament, so I, I'm not familiar with all of its history, but my understanding is that the, the most famous battles inside this, this parliament are between ITRE and IMCO. Uh, these are the two committees that also constantly fight over every digital file that arrives in this house. Um, and I won't venture, I won't tell what my personal opinion is as to, as yeah. to which one will get it because my colleagues will kill me. If I take sides, uh, mm -hmm. luckily I don't have that. Uh, luckily or unluckily, uh, my committee Aida is not a legislative one, um, so we are not going to deal with any piece of legislation because we are meant, as I was saying earlier, to pick up all of the threads and put them together in discussions that are not legislative, that are more strategic. But still, I I do agree with you. I do agree that, that this is a problem. That is why, as I was saying at the start of this parliament, I thought that we need to have one standing committee on digital affairs, not digital competencies or competencies on digital files in ITRE, in IMCO, in URI, in LIBE, and everywhere else. And I still believe that this is the smart way to organize ourselves, uh, knowing also what will come um, uh, for the years to uh, for the years that 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 that, that, that will come. So again. I'm hoping that at least for the next parliament, uh, wisdom will be found to then regroup competencies on, on digital files in one standing committee. And just one final question then from Melis Campbell from Reuters. Um, what are the next steps as regards adoption of the regulation? Um, that's it. <laughs> a long, a long, long negotiation. That's the next step. Um, yeah. And, and uh, the, the, there are two challenges here. Uh, the first challenge is, well, the text itself. Uh, it's massive. It has uh, a, lot of, a lot of technical details that need to be grasped. I can tell you, looking only at two of the four definitions in the prohibited category, I can tell you, and I anticipate that they'll be fighting for months as to actually what it means. What is manipulative behavior? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wish you good luck. Uh, in, in finding uh, agreement between uh, political groups and council as to what that means. So again, number one is the complexity of the text itself that will mean that there'll be a very complex and, and, and difficult and long negotiation. The second complexity, in my view, comes from the fact that, again, we would be stupid if we would not be looking, all of us that will be working in different, uh, different parts of the big digital puzzle that we have right now on the table of the co-legislators, if we don't look at each other while we evolve in the negotiations. Mm. Because it is not indifferent how you set up the rules in the DSA with the responsibility mm. and the obligations for digital platforms and how you set up the rules in the AI uh, and how you set up the rules in, in, the, in the set of documents that will be regulating the regime of data in the EU, whether industrial data or personal data or data owned by, by state and so on and so forth. So one of the complexities in these negotiations that will come will be to, to move in a, in a po policy and political coherent fashion with all of these negotiations uh, in parallel and, and trying to cross check and cross fertilize these negotiations to make sure that again, what, what you decide in, in one makes sense and is aligned with what you decide uh, on the other. It's never been done before, this sort of, <clears throat> this sort of negotiation. So uh, it's, it's going to be a very complex uh, period ahead. Mm. Well, unfortunately, Dragos, uh, we've come to the end. Time has caught up with us. So thank you very much for setting the scene. And I think raising the, those kind of strategic issues 
about the future of Europe, democracy, where we're going, how the state will run. And I think they're very interesting questions you raised there and got us certainly thinking about them. And also about the complexity of what's going to happen next. And the fact that although there's, there's numerous committees I think a task to try and integrate, as we will have to in Europe as well, as member states, but that the committees together are going to have to work coherently so that the policy that comes out doesn't have unintended un consequences in different areas. So really, thank you very much for your thoughtful uh, presentation. It was really excellent. And we, we will wish you well in your committee and see, see what's happened. And maybe when things get back, to so-called normal, we, we can welcome you to Dublin in person. And well, Travis, yes, you, you well, hope so. Yeah, ab absolutely. No, <laughs> you're very welcome and, and, and very much thanks for the invitation. Uh, I love Dublin uh, and with hopefully uh, as we will be able to resume some normality in our lives, uh, if you'll have yeah. me, I'll well, gladly we, we certainly will. We want to find out what has happened. And on your behalf and my behalf, I'd like to thank the audience for their questions and participation um, with great questions and apologies to those we couldn't come to. And also to thank our IIEA production team, Lorcan Mullally, and our researcher, Seamus Allen, the policy researcher for all the work that he did for this um, webinar. And our next event is another uh, one on Frontiers Technology. It's on the European blockchain strategy, uh, which is another complex technology. So that's on the 4th of June, and we hope we'll see you all on that day. So thank you very much again, Dragos, and we wish you all the very best. And thanks. Bye now. All the best. Bye. Thank you.